What's up friends? Today is a simple step-by-step -step tutorial of one of the most famous locations in the United States. It's Delicate Arch in Arches National Park in Utah. I had the privilege of visiting there last year and I got to take these beautiful photos and actually paint on location. And it was such a memorable experience. I wanna share a little of that with you today. If you wanna paint right along with me, just grab your supplies and you can jump in. These are the materials I'll be using in today's tutorial. This is Fabriano Artistico 140 pound cotton cold pressed watercolor paper in a block size five by seven inches it was actually on my very last sheet so i took it out and i'm just going to put it right here on my desk i have my standard palette of 18 colors i'll most likely be using phthalo blue this is the green shade so it's a cool blue i'll be using my ultramarine blue also which is my warmer blue i'll definitely be using burnt sienna and possibly some yellow ochre for more of those earth tones and I'll let you know if I decide to use any other colors, but I like to try to keep it a fairly limited palette, especially when I'm working on a quick and straight to the point kind of value study landscape. I wanna keep it more all about the shapes and the values and less about color. For brushes, you just need a round brush. I'll be doing most of the painting with a silver black velvet size 10 round brush, possibly switching to a smaller one for little details like cracks in the rocks and things like that. And of course, you'll need a pencil to sketch on your arch and some paper towel to control how much water's in your brush. If you're curious, about all the other colors on my palette. I do have a video about that. You can check that out after this video. So let's get started. We're gonna begin with a sketch and I'm gonna include the reference photo, by the way, for you to download. There's a link for that in the description, but you'll also be able to see the reference photo throughout this tutorial. So you can refer to that if you want to. All right, now if you're working from a reference photo, it's really helpful to make sure the aspect ratio, meaning the width to height ratio, is the same as your actual paper. That makes it a lot easier to just judge distances between the edges of your paper and the shapes that you're drawing. So right off the bat, I'm looking at the top of the arch. It comes a little left of center. And I'm just gonna make a rough pencil shape. I will probably sketch a little darker than I normally do for your benefit, just because it's hard to see in a video, but I want you to be able to see it. Normally I don't sketch dark. But when I start out, I do sketch really light because I don't wanna fully commit to any lines yet. And I don't wanna make any dark marks that are hard to erase on my paper. That makes sense, right? So there's the rough arch shape. It does not have to be perfect. Something close would be good though. I'm looking also at the size and shape of this cutout inside of the arch and narrowing that down a little bit. All right, and then we've got the distant mountain slope back here. It's actually about a third of the way down if you're coming from the top of the paper. And then of course it cuts through the arch and intersects with this little notch in the arch right there. And then comes up and kind of flattens out on this side. We also see a distant mountainscape back here. Don't sketch your clouds. That can all be done with paint. All right, so I'm pretty happy with that for my start. I know you can't see it very well, so I'm gonna tighten up the lines and just make it a little bit more committed at this point. I'm gonna start on the left side. And I know sketching can be really tricky, so if you're struggling with this sketch, there is a downloadable traceable line drawing also included in the description below. But give it a try, what have you got to lose? The more you practice, the easier it gets. All right, so you can see I'm starting to make more specific little bumps and curves and shapes in my lines here. And when I come over to the right side, which is more in the light, I'm going to press a little less hard, a little lighter with my pencil here. The left side, which is in shadow, you can get away with a nice dark line right there because you're gonna be putting dark paint over it. Okay, and then I'm gonna come back to this area, make a more specific shape. This is the most famous arch in the world, so I wanna make sure the shapes are correct, that, are, that they're accurate and actually match what the thousands of visitors who come there every year recognize and remember as delicate arch. It really is astonishing when you see it in person. How is that thing still standing after thousands of years? of Wind erosion, and it's just amazing. Okay, so let's complete the shape of this curve on the underside. Something else that'll be important to sketch when you're doing your quick sketch is the light and shadow shape. Well, really the shadow shape is what you're gonna sketch. The light will just be done with color and lack of color. In watercolor, of course, light, or at least white areas are captured by just leaving the white of the paper. But we do have to plan ahead for that so we know exactly where those areas are gonna be and can work to avoid them with our color. Now don't expect a freehand sketch to be absolutely perfect and be easy on yourself. Don't judge yourself too harshly if you don't get it right the first time. 
that's what erasers are for. So my initial marks were a little sloppy and I'm just kind of erasing those out. And then I'm gonna go ahead and draw this wonderful crack that happens at the bottom. This is helping me see kind of where I need to adjust my shapes. I think I made the base a little too wide. I'm gonna move this over so I don't drag my hand in that paint. Yeah, I made the base of the arch just a bit too wide, so I'm gonna narrow it up, tilt it up so I can see a little bit better what I'm doing. Yeah, now when I double check my shapes here, I think, I think they're pretty close. Before I complete this area, because I don't think it's quite right yet, I'm gonna go ahead and draw the shadow shape. This will be important to include so you know where to apply your darkest color. And our big shadow shapes, we wanna try to do all in one pass with our paint. So that's why we wanna really plan ahead and make sure we mix enough paint up for that. Kinda of getting ahead of myself here, but it's helpful to know where we're headed with this, right? One of the biggest mistakes I see beginners making with landscape paintings is that they want to try to paint everything in little sections with too little of a brush. And we're gonna try painting in big, broad sections and seeing the bigger shapes as connected pieces. And I think you'll find that overall you'll end up with a much stronger painting if you try to see it that way with more connections particularly between your shadows. All right, so I lowered this line just a little bit. I thought that was a bit off. This is better. And then I'm adjusting this shape. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. I have to tell myself that too. All right, there's a little divot, a little concave shape in the rock right there. Some interesting little marks. We don't have to include all these with our pencil sketch. Most of this can be done with paint. And we're not going to get too detailed. This is only five by seven inches, so don't go crazy with the details. And then last, we're going to sketch where the darkest shadow happens back here behind the arch. When we paint that in, it's really going to help that arch pop forward in space and look so amazing. A couple little mountain shapes back here, shadows in the rocks. But again, no super tight details just yet just getting the main things in. And here in the foreground, it's just gonna be kind of a scribble of color. I do wanna include this big curve that happens right in the middle of the base of the arch there. Yeah, all right. I probably made it a little too short and fat, but that's okay, we'll work with it. Really quick, if you're enjoying this free real-time tutorial, be sure to check out Watercolor Mastery. There are so many more tutorials just like this one, including our daily challenges, which are released every weekday. They are 20 to 30 minutes long. They all include a traceable line drawing and reference photo. And just like in this video, you can look right over my shoulder and paint right along with me. To learn more, there's a link in the description. You can check that out after this video. All right, let's get back to the painting. Now that the sketch is done, we get to start painting. With landscapes, I almost always start with the sky. It's just easier to work background to foreground. And usually the sky is your lightest value anyway. So I'm gonna grab my round brush, my biggest one here. And I mentioned I'd be using phthalo blue for the background sky. I do want to leave a little bit of a hard edge where one of these puffy clouds is. So I'm just gonna paint around that edge with clear water here and then work more freely. Now do paint around the arch. You don't want to adulterate the color of your arch with blue underneath. That would mess up the look of your red rocks. So in this initial background, you gotta paint around that arch. That's probably the hardest part is just kind of working around it. Now underneath the cloud, I'm gonna paint more freely and also into those background mountains. Really doesn't matter if you wet that area. The color can all seep into that. You have to kind of think, okay, is it okay if this blue that I lay down seeps into this area? That's what you're asking yourself. Where is it okay to be a little messy with your wet on wet? Because wherever your paper is wet, the paint will potentially flow. Now you can definitely paint right up to an area, but there's still gonna be a little bit of seeping of color. So that's why we have to be okay with wherever we're wetting the paper, some of that paint seeping into it and potentially changing the color of the layers you put on top. So this is why planning ahead and working in layers, but understanding what color does what <laughs> to the next layer is so vital with watercolor. Okay, so I just let that little strip of paper be a dry spot. 
and everywhere else is wet. All right, so now I'm gonna grab my phthalo blue. I've already pre-wet it on my palette, which really helps so I don't have to do a lot of scrubbing with my brush. And I'm gonna start here at the top and just try to pull that along. You don't have to make your cloud shapes exactly like the photo. That's the beauty of clouds. They just come in all shapes and sizes. So you can make them however you want. I'm going to just leave a little streak of white there, kind of in the middle. And I want it to look like there's this flow upward at an angle going this direction. So yeah, that's the beauty of clouds. You can fashion them however you wish. Got to make sure that my blue comes under the arch in between here can cross over those mountains. And then I need to make this blue sky a little more specific. Okay, and my biggest cloud is right here on the left side. This is where I'm gonna need to paint a cloud shadow. So if you're finding that the paint is just kind of running more than you want it to, bleeding more than you want it to, lift some of it out. Dry that surface again. The problem is that you just have too much water in your brush and that's why it's running. Okay, now for the cloud shadow, I'm gonna just take a touch of burnt sienna and a little bit of, let's take some violet, just a tiny hint of it. I want sort of a violet gray. I'm gonna put that in the underside of this cloud for a lovely shadow, and that may not be dark enough, so maybe a little hint of indigo. Just dabbing it in. Really, really important, again, that you've controlled how much water is in your brush. That's what your paper towel is for. Just keep blotting on there. And suddenly, those clouds just look heavier. When you add a cloud shadow, they just feel like they have some weight to them. It's lovely. Over on this side, we'll make those just a little less descript. And yeah, don't expect your clouds and your sky to look just like the photo. I never expect that. And I'm usually much happier when I don't have expectations for the result. <laughs> I want to touch on these mountains back here just a little bit, but I need to let it dry first. Otherwise, it's just going to blur out. I can speed up the drying process with a heat tool. I think I'm gonna to need to let it dry all the way because the next step for me is gonna to be to paint all the midtones in on the arch. So I'm gonna grab my heat tool. This is a Sizzix heat tool. You can get these on Amazon. And I'm gonna dry it. Okay, the next step is to paint in all of our foreground and background the same color. I know that sounds a little weird. They're different colors in the image, right? Well, we're gonna start with our lightest value and it's just gonna be a simple wash of burnt sienna. Now I'm trying to imagine if I was out on the field painting this from life, which I've done, this is what I would do. I would try to block in as much of the midtone as I can all at once and then glaze darker values on top of that. So I'm mixing up a really generous amount of watery burnt sienna on my palette. You can just see how much that is. You need a big enough puddle to cover all of this. And I'm gonna work wet and dry this time. So I'll have to work fast to make it one cohesive flat wash. And if you wanna tilt your paper upright a little bit, you certainly can. That helps gravity work in your favor. So start at the top, start at the top of your arch. and just keep pulling your paint downward. We're just coloring in inside of our lines as fast as we can. If you use more paint, it forms a nice wet bead there. And you can just let that sit as long as you need to and it won't form a hard edge while you work elsewhere. So we'll just keep going down. Now when I get to this background, I'm going to fill that in too. So you can connect now the entire shape all the way across like that. Ooh, I didn't mix up enough. Mix up more. Now there is a section of the land back here that's a little more uh, greenish gray 
in color. And so for that, I'm going to take some yellow ochre and some of that phthalo blue and mix that up real quick over here and have a, a little bit of a temperature change, but it's about the same value. And I can bring that across to the other side of the arch over here, rinse that out, and then switch right back to my burnt sienna. Tilting it again, I want to keep going with this oops, color over here. Staying inside your lines as best you can. But if you're working with a big enough brush, this should go pretty quickly. And again, you can connect it all the way over to the other side of that landscape right there. Now, as you approach the foreground, you might want to switch to more of a yellow tone so you can mix in some yellow ochre with your burnt sienna and loosen up your brush strokes. This is where you can do some dry brush techniques, just kind of a quick sweeping motion, something like that. And you can definitely leave the bottom part of your painting unfinished. I think that looks really nice, in fact. Okay, so that's it for our first quick wash, and already it's looking like a landscape. As we start to build up our values, it'll look more and more like what we're seeing in the image. Let's let this dry all the way. I'm gonna switch to my smaller brush now and actually paint the little mountains back here before I move on to more of the foreground. And for this, I'm gonna use a little bit of ultramarine blue. Might need a separate section in my palette to mix that up. Slightly watered down and a milky consistency. I'm just gonna go ahead and paint, might still be a little dark, the mountain shape back here. Connecting it across to the other side again. Rinse and remove, and then I'm gonna take the burnt sienna that's on my palette Paint that right up next to the blue while that's still a little wet. Try not to have any extra water in your brush. And then we got a streak of blue right under that. That's pretty much it for that area. No need to go into any more detail. Okay, next is gonna be this next ridge behind our arch. The temptation will be to add lots and lots of detail and color to this. You see a lot of ridges and just, I don't know, slopes and shapes back there. What do you see when you just squint at the reference photo? I see a big dark shape here and here, and I see a dark shape here with a slightly lighter shape here. Dark, I'm just looking at light and dark. And then I do see a few of these deep cracks in the rock that still show up as dark shadows when I squint. So I'm gonna include some of those. But for the most part, I'm looking at value. So overall, this background needs to be a lot darker. We're gonna take our burnt sienna and just darken it up. So more pigment on the palette now. And I want to make it more of a chocolate brown. To do that, I can mix in ultramarine. So for a deep, rich chocolate brown. Now I don't have to mix this directly on my palette if I don't want to. In fact, it might look more interesting. That's one way to do it. But I think it would look more interesting if I actually start with the ultramarine on the paper and then mix the burnt sienna over the top. I'll show you what I mean. So let's take ultramarine. We're gonna have to do this fast, but we can work in little sections. And we'll start left to right. If you're right-handed like me, this is the best way to do it. And we'll just go ahead and paint our darkest area, almost black here, with our ultramarine blue. Watch out for the arch, of course. Paint right up to it. And then grab burnt sienna and drop that in over the top while the ultramarine is still wet. Okay, so let's do that again. Actually, before I go on, I'm gonna take some lighter burnt sienna and paint that right next to my shadow shapes. Just kind of darkening up that whole ridge. Yeah, that looks nice. Okay, now the next section, I'm gonna work the opposite way I just did. I'm gonna start with that lighter burnt sienna and just paint the whole ridge that color. Intensifying 
the value. And I can actually pull this color. Ooh, I can pull this color into the arch. I see it in the shadow right here. Wherever possible, connect your shadow shapes. And then there's a big shadow right here. And then kind of this yellowish gray green in this middle section. And I pushed into my line a little bit there, so I'm gonna scrub that out. Okay. Now, you can grab your ultramarine. Very thick, creamy paint on your brush. But if you need to dip in the water to get it flowing, go ahead. And then we'll paint that over the top of the burnt sienna this time. So we're working a little bit backwards. I'll show you how you can actually do it one way or the other. Get similar results. And now we can paint around some of the highlights in this ridge. But don't go crazy with the details here. You don't need a lot of detail. Isn't that pretty? Just looks so nice. And then be brave here. Use big broad brush strokes for your dark shadow in between the arch. Okay, I'm going to rinse and remove and actually switch to my smaller brush. And you'll notice that I lost this highlight on the ridge here. So I'm going to just take my thirsty brush and swipe and remove some of the paint there, restoring the light. Yeah. All right. So there's that section. Let's move on to the right side. I won't do this one a different way, I promise. <laughs> this time I'm going to do it the same way I did in the center, starting with a light wash of burnt sienna to just darken the whole slope. Painting around the arch. Okay, now I want to connect it a little better to this shape here. So I'm taking some more of that green gray we mixed up earlier, painting it wet next to wet, side by side like that. And then switching back to the burnt sienna where you see that color shift happening along the ridge here. Now notice I'm working with this big brush so I can put down a lot of paint really fast and that's really essential if you wanna get this effect. So then we immediately switch to our ultramarine and start blobbing this in wherever those dark, dark shadows are. Gotta do this fast, it's all about timing. Watercolor is one of those few, one of those few art mediums that is really completely reliant on timing and if you mess up the timing, you don't quite get the effect you wanted. So that's the aspect of it that I think takes the most practice and I think scares the most people off. But if you're here and you're practicing and painting with me today, good job. You are one of the few, one of the brave. I applaud you, keep painting. And it does get so much easier. I know some people maybe tried it once and were like, that was too hard. I'm gonna switch to something else. And But good for you for not giving up, continuing to practice and log those brush miles. And it really, really does get easier. Okay, then this big, big dark shape here. Already my paper dried quite a bit, but that's okay. I can use thick creamy paint go right over the top of that burnt sienna and get a beautiful convincing shadow okay at this point we are ready to paint our arch the most fun and exciting part so what we need to do now is add a second layer of more of a mid-tone color while leaving some of the luminous first layer shining through so let me clean up my palette a little bit i don't need these colors anymore so i'm still going to stick with my large brush for this second layer on the arch itself. And I want a bit more vibrant color this time. So I'm actually going to use my Scarlet Lake mixed with the Burnt Sienna and add some water. You can also use some yellow if you have a warm yellow to mix in. Maybe I'll use some Gamboge Nova. There we go. This is my warm yellow and Indian yellow would work well too. All right, we're gonna take this nice milky consistency of paint and just wash over almost the entire arch once again. So starting at the top, 
Now squint at your reference photo. If you see any areas that are much brighter and lighter, don't paint those with this wash, okay? We want to preserve some of that first layer so it really looks brilliantly sunlit. So for example, over here on the right side, that's where the sun is hitting. I'm gonna leave some of that untouched by this color. But most of it, we can cover up with this second wash, this mid-tone. And then use loose, expressive brush strokes. Pull that down into the foreground. And the temptation, of course, is usually to overwork or to pick at something. Don't do that. Try to do it as fast as you can and all in one pass. There. Let's let that dry. And then we'll do our third and possibly final layer. All right, for our final layer, I'm going to switch to my smaller round brush the size what is this, a size six round brush. And I'm going to use thick, creamy, burnt sienna. Now in the areas of the shadow where I wanna go a little darker, I will be dipping into my ultramarine blue to create that deep chocolatey brown like you saw in our background here. So, but start with pure, rich burnt sienna. You want a warm, reddish brown for this. And we're gonna to try to paint our whole shadow shape all in one go. So I'm starting at the top and just tracing the left edge and then stopping where I see light, skipping over to the shadow side again. There's this intricate little crack right here. Feel free to include that if you want to or if it's too small, don't worry about it. Then I'm going to remove a little bit, scrape that off so I have a little lighter value in my brush and create a subtle transition from dark to light right there. And then I keep going. I'm going to connect that to this interesting shape inside of the arch. I remember when I was painting this from life, the shadow shape kept changing, of course, as the, the sun's position was changing. And that was challenging. I had to sketch in the shadow shape and then just work from memory as it shifted and changed. And I think it's best to make a decision and stick with it rather than trying to chase the light. So just a fun little difference between painting from a photo versus from life. Okay, now really quickly, I'm gonna dip into my ultramarine. You might have to scrub to lift a little bit out of your palette. And I'm going to blob that in on the left side of the arch where the shadow is the strongest and darkest. And then we also see that in the crack in the shadow, but don't look too deeply into your shadows. You don't wanna to add too much detail there. Okay, I'm gonna rinse that out and then right back to my burnt sienna. Continue to work using loose but decisive brush strokes to create the shapes that I see in the shadows. We'll get to the smaller details in a bit. This is just the big shadow shapes. But already you might be starting to see it just kind of popping off the page and looking so much more three-dimensional just with three or four values. It's amazing how that works. And then of course this line coming across And I don't think I need any more ultramarine to mix in. Okay, so now I'm gonna do, do some dry brush techniques. So I'm gonna take my brush, which is loaded with paint, and gently scrape it across the surface. I mean, you could call this glazing too, but the nice thing about using a sort of dry brush is that you can let it catch on the surface of the paper and it will actually skip some of the little valleys in the paper let me see if I can show you this more effectively and create interesting rock texture. It takes a little bit of practice to get the right angle and the right brush wetness, 
for this particular technique, but this is something I use all the time for rock texture, especially. It almost feels like cheating. It's such a shortcut, <laughs> which is great. Any chance you can get to create a shortcut with watercolor? Yes, I'm all about that. So I am constantly glancing back and forth between my reference photo and my painting, trying to match just the interesting character qualities of the rocks that I see and just be true to those. Especially when you're painting something this iconic, you want to capture as much of what it really looks like as you can. It'd be one thing if it was more of a generic scene that no one necessarily knows where it is, then you can pretty much do whatever you want. But for something this iconic, oops, made a little mistake there. So what I'm doing is re-wetting it and just gently lifting it out with my clean brush. All right, so keep moving along. Burnt Sienna is really the only color I needed for this. I'm gonna push around some of that ultramarine and just make it feel more natural in that shadow. And then add some of my ultramarine Burnt Sienna mix to this left side. Anywhere else you wanna put almost black shadows, just use Burnt Sienna and ultramarine. It's the best combo ever for shadows in nature. One of my favorite combos. And I use Daniel Smith for both of those. But any brand would work. Okay, so there I just hinted at some of those rocks over there. And then we're just missing shadow shape right here. This is your chance to do all those fun little details I know you've been waiting to do. You can even use your finger. <laughs> Quick dry brush technique across the front. Notice how I'm not putting a lot of detail in the foreground. It's really not necessary. I think I do want a little more of a yellow tone. So I'm gonna take Gamboge Nova, water down slightly, and just kind of brush that across across the foreground here and bring some of that into the arch itself. Want to have some color harmony. So if you decide to put yellow in one spot of the painting, unless that's like a focal point, don't do that. Try to scatter around in other areas so that you have color harmony. It's all about balance. That's what this whole painting is about. One of the most delicate balances in nature that we've ever seen is this rock itself. So let's make our painting as balanced as we can to do the subject matter justice. All right, I'm just touching up, looking for any areas that need more color, more value, mostly value is what I'm looking at. But I'm also adding, you know, little cracks and details. Don't go overboard with this. It's really easy to just try to see every single one. But I would say focus on the ones that really stand out to you when you blur your eyes or squint at that reference photo. Those are the ones you want to make sure you include. Just using some more ultramarine to intensify the shadows. And this one got washed out, so I'm reintroducing that shadow shape. Yeah, there we go. There's our finished delicate arch. Thank you for painting Delicate Arch with me. If you haven't had a chance to visit this national park, I hope you have a chance someday. It's absolutely beautiful. Check out this next video and I'll see you over there.